Dave Town is a local chiropractor who has a passion for local history, and we all know that. <laughs> he has spent countless hours scouring through the archival material at the library and scrolling through the old Aurelia newspapers on microfilm, piecing together the stories buried in Aurelia's past. Dave has supported and participated in the library's annual remembrance event, speaking to hundreds of local students over the years about members of Aurelia's championship hockey team who fought in World War I and the world famous Dumbbells. To date, he has published 11 books, six more shorter booklets and some 25 short essays all documenting events and stories regarding our community, many of them long lost and forgotten. Tonight, we are going to hear two of these stories about Aurelia's two riots, a hundred years apart. When Dave is not in his office or at the library researching, he is likely down at the swimming pool. He is a champion swimmer, having been on Canada's national swim team, and he still trains and competes. Over the years, he has set four world records for his age and over 60 Canadian records. But tonight, it's all about history. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to introduce Dave Town. Thank you, Jane. It's always hard to hear someone talk to you, talk about you like that, but thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be able to support the library in, in this program. Um, um, the library has been a very big part of my life for a long time, needless to say, and uh, it's always nice to be able to give back a little bit. Um, tonight I've got two stories about the riots in Aurelia. Um, the first one is the Aurelia riot. I'm going to take you all the way back to the year 1844, when Aurelia was a tiny village that was only five years old. So in 1839, the Chippewa, who had been placed on a reservation um, that included the town site of Aurelia, in 1839, they had been forced off and over to Rama, and the white settlers began coming down over the hill and uh, setting up this little village. So here, here's a picture from 10 years after the riot. You can still see how small the town was, um, and you can also see how barren it was. Uh, the big open space on the top of the hill, that was a, a massive cornfield they had made for the, Chippewa had made um, for their village. Um, um, but not a tree to be seen. And they haven't painted in all the stumps you're gonna see in a minute. Um, the, the white settlers who came and settled in Aurelia and in, in the area had two very powerful influences that enter into our story. The one was uh, the strong, uh, ethnic ties they had to their homeland. So there were three main groups who settled in and around Aurelia. Um, in, in Aurelia proper, it was a lot of Englishmen um, with a smattering of, of other uh, nationalities, um, but they're mostly uh, staunch Anglicans um, um, coming from England. Out to the, um, to the west up in Medonte, there was a small smattering of uh, Ulstermen from Northern Ireland. Again, um, good English Protestants. But down in Oro to the southwest, um, there was a very large contingent of very patriotic Highland Scots. Um, they, they came um, almost entirely from the island, uh, Isle of Islay in the uh, northwest, off the northwest coast. Um, they came here after 1815 when the Highland clearances were coming to their part. Of, of, of Scotland. The British were intent on breaking up the clan system um, and they were doing that by forcing a change from uh, market gardening to sheep herding. And as they went uh, county by county, clan by clan, either you make the change or you leave voluntarily. And the, the uh, men in Isle saw the writing on the wall, the clearance was coming to the island and they all got up and moved off to the colonies and a lot of them came to Upper Canada and they seemed to make their way out to Oro and so Oro was populated by these very fervently patriotic Highland Scots. The second influence was religion. As I said the the Englishmen were very strong Anglicans and the Ulstermen but the Highland Scots um, Ireland had a lot of Presbyterians that was mostly in the lowlands. In the highlands 
there was still a lot of affinity to the Catholic religion. And there were pockets of very strong uh, Catholicism throughout there, which I believe included the island of Islay, where they came from. Um, this stems back to the um, to the wars in 18, or 1746 with Bonnie Prince Charlie and the, trying to fight for independence. But the, the French came in and they, they were Catholic. And so the Scots got this affinity for the Catholics. But anyway, the, um, the Scots in Orobodonte, they weren't all Catholic, but they had an affinity for the Catholic religion. Now, all of the, all of the pioneers in Upper Canada um, shared one very powerful trait, and that was they were risk takers. They had given up um, pretty comfortable um, situations um, in the home country. I mean, a lot of them came from poverty, but at least they knew where they stood in society. They, they get on the boat and they come here and uh, the attraction was free or cheap land, but they get there and it'd be forest or swamp or hill or gravel, and they would have to make a living out of that. And so these are the kind of houses they lived in. Uh, this was actually painted in 1844, the year of the riot. Um, but they came here, it was a hard, hard life. Um, the necessity as pioneers had to take a very capitalistic approach to the world. Everything was business. Everything was about how do I better my situation? How do I establish myself for my children's benefit down the road? Um, do I clear another acre of land? Um, do I plant wheat or barley this year? Do I buy a cow? It's all, it's all looking at what is the best business move to get me ahead. And everything they did was a risk. So, so these men were not adverse to gambling. Um, they, they, were, they were gambling every day, deciding what, what they were going to do to get themselves ahead. So th th this is the situation in 1844. We had this little village of Aurelia. The population was about 100 people, um, mostly Englishmen, um, trying to make a living. This brings us to uh, James Fraser. James Fraser was a Highland Scot. He had, he had come, he had tried the farm life and pioneer life wasn't for him. So in 1834, he set up a tavern out in Price's Corners, which was halfway on the road from Aurelia to Coldwater, which was the same as going from Aurelia to Georgian Bay. Um, and his tavern did well. He was a, a carpenter by trade and he, was, he had good business as, uh, being hired out as a carpenter, but mostly it was the tavern. In 1834, 39, Chippewa moved to Rama. He was one of the first people to come and buy up a lot in, in and around Aurelia. And he bought the four acres that is now Kuchiching Park. So he's about a quarter mile north of the village of Aurelia, but he had the beautiful promontory and the deep water waterfront because in Aurelia, it was muddy and four feet deep for 200 yards out. So he bought the prime piece of waterfront there and he built himself another tavern. Um, in front of his tavern, he built the wharf, and that wharf is exactly where the wharf in the park is today, coming off uh, where Champlain Monument is. His tavern was right exactly where Champlain Monument was. And in 1844, he had the wherewithal, he was doing well enough that he had a schooner built for himself. And so on his wharf was parked this 35 foot schooner. Now you're looking at a picture of the Curlew from 1870. Um, his schooner was uh, seven to 10 feet longer than that, um, but it was the same basic design. This gives you an idea of what it is. Um, his schooner, the Undyne, 35 feet long. It had two masts, like this picture has. It had seven sails. It had a keel that was only about a foot long because it had to get into a lot of shallow sandy ports. And if you had a six foot keel, you couldn't get into shore um, because the boat was, was a working boat. It transported lumber and supplies and uh, um, limestone from Utah and people all around the area. It was a very valuable transportation. Um, there was um, a, a steamer that came in, the Beaver, but it was, it was slow and it was expensive to rent. And there were barges, but they were really slow. Um, the schooner was the fastest boat on the lake and it was famous for how fast it was. One of the significant things about these schooners is that they were open boats. They were like big rowboats and they would go and they would pick up a load of lumber and it would go into the bottom of the boat. And that was the ballast that kept it upright. And that's why it only needed a one foot keel because it was always heavily loaded. 
when it was not heavily loaded, um, it could be pretty tippy. But uh, he built this boat and he parked it at his dock and it was like having a Maserati parked in your driveway. It was, it was uh, a sight to behold and it attracted men to his tavern because his tavern was a quarter mile north of the town and there was a tavern right in Aurelia, but he was trying to attract business. Um, he was a capitalist like the rest of them. And he took the gamble of building this boat like all the pioneers make gambles. So he built this boat in 1844 and word quickly spread to the two other um, communities that had working schooners like this. One was in Barrie and one was in Holland Landing down in Bradford. Um, the two schooners down there were of comparable size and they were working around Lake Simcoe. And James Fraser put out a challenge to these two communities. He wanted to have a sailing race. Which boat is the fastest? And they avalanched. So in September of 1844, the date was set for a big sailing race on Lake Kuchching. Now, pioneer life out in Oro Madati was terribly boring. You, you had 18 hours a day of backbreaking work. There were no holidays. Um, and the social gatherings, gatherings were few and far between. You had to be the, the church gatherings or weddings or a barn raising, but maybe once or twice a year, you get together and see your neighbors. So when the word got out that there was a big race on, well, that was an event that people wanted to come to. And he didn't have to advertise. The word just spread. And on the day of the race, men from all over the region started streaming into Aurelia, coming down to where Coochie Park is today to witness um, the big sailing race. The Remember, James Fraser was a Highland Scot. He hired a captain, um, um, James Scott, um, to captain his sailboat. Um, who was also a Highland Scot. So the men from Oro uh, came in especially large numbers to uh, support uh, their countrymen in the captain of the boat and James Fraser. This turned out to be a holiday for the men. They never got days off, so a, a day away from the farm was a holiday. Um, the men traveled uh, as far as 15 miles to get there. There were no horses, they were all on foot, and about 15 miles is about as far as you could walk in a day. So uh, James Fraser scheduled the race for late in the afternoon to give the men time to get there, and also to give the men time to drink some of his whiskey once they got to the tavern. And he was foreseeing a day of brisk sales. So what we have here now is um, a large group of men coming down for a holiday where there's plenty of alcohol, um, and there's a gambling event. Sports were very different back in the 1840s than they are today. It wasn't so much about the competition as it was about uh, an opportunity for men to gamble. And gamble they did. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of pounds of very precious money was being gambled on or wagered on the outcome of this and some other races. Um, they had time to um, see the boats um, out in the water to decide who was going to be the fastest or they were going to support their home boat. There were um, crowds of people from Barrie and Bradford also made the trip up to support their boat. Uh, and the money was, was flowing pretty freely on this day. People were in a good mood. They saw this as an opportunity to get ahead. You, this is a chance to double your money. If you're really confident that you've got some inside scoop, you know which boat is fastest, you can double your life savings. And they bet large sums on this, which, which shows you just what risk takers these pioneers were. So the day of the race, there was a brisk wind. There were white caps out in the water. James Fraser had set up a, a series of preliminary races as the men were still streaming into town and remember, they're walking 50 miles from, uh, say, Hawkstone. Um, there were two taverns they would pass on the way in. So they would walk for eight or 10 miles and they stop and have a beer and they'd walk another four miles and they stop in and have another whiskey. And then they'd get to the waterfront and they'd up to, to James Fraser's tavern and have a couple more whiskeys. They were all in pretty good spirits by the time they got there. And while the men were streaming in, Fraser had uh, some preliminary races. He had uh, canoe races. Um, and you can imagine 
um, out in the brisk winds and the white caps trying to stage two new races and then the winners jumping up and showboating and you're sure some people fell in the water and it was just good times were being had by all. Then they, they had skiffs coming out, rowing skiffs. Um, these were the, the precursors to the, the long slender skulls that you see racing today. These were um, eight man rowboats that were four feet wide and 40 feet long. Um, they were, they were the, tr the torpedoes on the lake in those days. And they were heading out into um, the whitecaps. And you can imagine how hard it is to turn a very tippy 40 foot boat around when there's whitecaps coming in. So again, there was a lot of uh, amusement and fun and uh, high spirits, always knowing that those sailboats moored out in the bay were getting ready to start the big race. Now the race, um, if we go to the next slide, it shows the race course, um, went from Fraser's Wharf, just north of Aurelia, out to Chief's Island, it doesn't say exactly where, so I just threw it in, but it's out to Chief's Island, around a buoy, and, and back, to, uh, back to the wharf. Just before the wharf, they had to go around a second buoy, so they went across uh, in front of the crowd. I guess that's to make it um, more fun for the, for the crowd to see who was winning. So late in the afternoon, people are in high spirits. Most of them are pretty tipsy by this point. Just about everybody had a pretty strong vested interest in this race. Um, with their gambling and uh, the three boats came up to the starting line the starting gun went off and they raced off into the wind it became clear right from the very beginning that the undying James Fraser's boat was inching ahead and it it was clearly the better of the three boats but it had to go way out into the bay you know three kilometers out turn around and come three kilometers back and as he came down um, and he's going around that last buoy to come across the waterfront. Um, he was probably several hundred yards ahead of the second boat, the Petrel, out of, out of Holland Landing. Um, he was coming across, cruising to victory. The Highland Scots, who all had their money on him, were, were hooting and hollering and having a great time because they were about to double their money. And a sudden gust of wind came up. It caught James Scott, the captain of the Undyne by surprise, he didn't respond quickly enough. His boat heeled over and suddenly the water came over the gunnel. And once it started coming over the gunnel, it kept coming over and his boat capsized. Um, less than a quarter mile from the finish line, uh, the boat is on its side, rolling upside down in the water. Um, it's unclear, there were at least two men, there were probably four men in that boat manning the sails, there's seven sails, um, they're in the water. Now this is mid to late September, so it's getting pretty cold. Um, there's white caps and it's pretty clear that the men can't swim. So the second place boat, the Petrol from, from Holland Landing is coming up behind it and makes a very conscious turn to swoop around the boat and continue on and cross the finish line. Now, all the pioneer settlers um, in this area are coming from the British Isles. They're all maritime men. They're all familiar with the laws of the sea. And the laws of the sea say that when a boat is in distress, you are obliged to help the boat. Well, the captain of the Petrel made a conscious effort to avoid the upsized boat and continued on to win the race. Um, the third place boat out of Barrie, it came up and it stopped and it gathered the poor men in the water and brought them into the wharf. Well, the Highland Scots, when they saw their countrymen floundering in the water, clearly unable to swim, calling for help in the Whitecaps, and the Barrie boat consciously avoid them and leave them to their doom, decided something had to be done. They raced down to the wharf to accost the referee who was in charge of, of uh, adjudicating the race. And uh, the referee said, the race goes on. Um, well, the Highland Scots were having none of that. If the referee was not going to uphold the maritime laws of the sea, well, maybe they were gonna have to do it. The two boats with the three crews came into the wharf to get together. And as the um, captain of the Petrel, the Holland landing boat who, who had uh, made the faux pas sailing past the, the wreck. As he climbed out of the boat, he confronted an angry mob 
who were out for blood. Um, he tried to defend himself saying as, as an experienced captain, the rules of racing are different. You're allowed to finish the race as long as you go back and rescue the men after the race. But the Highland Scots were having none of that. Um, if the referee was not going to uh, call a default on this race and punish the winning boat, then they were going to do something about it. The crews of the other two boats rallied around the Barry or the Holland Landing crew and put themselves between them and the rowdy crowd. The rowdy crowd of Highland Scots began to force their way down onto the docks to get to get the captain. Now you have to understand the Highland Scots in Oro had a very strong reputation of being bullies. Um, they were led um, by Big Sandy Clark um, of the 10th line of Oro. He was the ringleader. He was forever bringing groups of men down to the taverns in Aurelia and starting brawls um, just for the fun of it. Um, they were well known as brawlers. And now that crowd of Highland Scots were forcing their way onto the dock uh, out for blood for this this captain. Well, the Englishmen from Aurelia decided they didn't want a brawl and they tried to interject themselves between the Scots and the sailing crews. Um, pushing led to shoving, led to insults, led to fists being thrown. And once the first fist was thrown, the fight was on. Almost instantly, 500 men were brawling on the shore of Lake Kujiching. Um, the Highland Scots, as soon as they saw this band of bullies um, getting into fisticuffs, the Highland Scots rushed to the wharf. On their way to the wharf, um, they destroyed James Fraser's garden. He had a beautiful English garden he had built with, uh, um, with a vegetable garden in there. He had a beautiful white picket fence uh, around it to keep the rabbits out of his vegetables. The Scots destroyed the fence, taking the pickets as weapons as they raced down to the waterfront. As they raced down to the waterfront armed with these, with these clubs, the rest of the Englishmen in the crowd swarmed down to try to stop them. And that's why you suddenly had 500 men duking it out down on the shore of Lake, of Lake Kuchiching. Now remember, Aurelia was a town of only 100 people, and now here's 500 men fighting. Um, and it was a desperate battle. There were, there were reports that men ran down to the waterfront and picked up rocks and began throwing rocks into the middle of the crowd just to stir things up. Um, it, was, it was pretty brutal. There were men really getting hurt down there. Well, someone in the crowd from Aurelia decided something had to be done. And uh, there being no police force, they thought the only person who could bring law and order to this were the magistrates, the judges. So someone ran off and first he, he dug up Andrew Moffat. This is him 25 years later. Um, um, and magistrate Andrew Moffat, whose, whose uh, store was at the corner of Mississauga and Front Streets or Mississauga Machida Streets. So that was, you know, that was half a kilometer to, to run that far, get a hold of him. He says, we need the senior magistrate, we need James Dallas. And so they send a runner off to James Dallas. Well, James Dallas, you had to go up Mississauga to West Street, down West Street, down past where the rec center is today. And then he owned uh, 100 acres of property off to the west of that. So it was probably another kilometer just to get to his house um, to say there's a riot. We need someone to come and take control. Well, Dallas and Moffat, the two magistrates, got together. They rounded up 20 men. They deputized them as special constables. And that group of 20-odd men marched down to the waterfront where, where the riot was still going on. And it's, 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 uh, it's very late in the afternoon, so we're, we're probably um, getting down to 6 o'clock. The sun's setting in, in, in the western sky. Dallas arrives with his 20 men and he announces, we're here with the constabulary, we want you to stop fighting. And of course, everyone ignores him because they're busy duking it out. So he climbs up on a stump and he reads the riot act and nothing happens. So he gets down off his stump, he grabs his 20 constables, he heads down to where the fighting is the worst towards the dock. He climbs up on another stump, he reads the riot act again, again, no response. People are ignoring him. So. He tells his constables, go in there, find the rig leaders and arrest them. 
So remember, there's 500 men fighting and he's sending 20 men in to stop them. And they all knew who the troublemakers were because Big Sandy Clark and his gang were always the troublemakers whenever there was a problem in town. They knew the epicenter of the fight was down at the wharf, so the constables head down towards the wharf, and sure enough, there's Big Sandy Clark and all the usual cast of characters. They go in there and they start arresting them. Um, they start manhandling these guys and uh, roasting them out and dragging them off into town. There's no jail, so they take them probably to a, the fur warehouse and uh, tie them up in the warehouse just to get them out of there. Um, they ended up arresting uh, probably 10 or 15 men and, and get them safely stowed away. By then, the sun is, the sun is going down and it's getting on to dusk. They've been at it probably for over an hour. And the, the riot pretty much just plays itself out. The ringleaders are gone. Um, the cooler heads are starting to prevail. People are getting tired. They're all drunk. And uh, it pretty much plays itself out as the sun goes down behind the horizon. By the time it's dark out and uh, things have calmed down, there being no jail, the magistrates release their prisoners um, to walk home. And everyone just starts leaving. Um, the passions have been quelled and uh, that's the end of it. Those who lived close enough were able to walk home in the dark, um, but a lot of men just found whatever shelter they could find and curled up and spent the night and slept off their whiskey. So in the morning when, when James Fraser wakes up to survey the damage, um, he, he saw little gatherings of men all around his property uh, surveying the damage that was done and talking about the events and sort of getting ready to go home. Um, but uh, it was a quiet, it was a quiet morning. Now for James Fraser, he's got to look at how well did this whole event go off for him? He looks out, his picket fence has been destroyed and it's not easy to build a picket fence when you're a pioneer. Um, his English gardens and his vegetable garden have been completely trampled. Um, his boat, his beautiful brand new schooner is upside down on the beach where they had pulled it in, broken masts. Um, it was salvageable, but he had to find new masts, so it was going to be expensive. But on the other side, he had a strong box stuffed full of money of the whiskey that he sold. It was a pretty good promotion for him. So uh, who knows if he thought it was a worthwhile effort or not. Um, the other two schooners had, uh, had left early in the morning and sailed for home. The men who had been released um, um, were just let go except for Big Sandy Clark. He was ordered to appear before um, a judge in Barrie um, a, a few days later. And sure enough, that day came and when Judge Gowan found he wasn't coming, um, he was irate. This is a brand new judge and he was out to assert his authority. So he called in one of the uh, county constables and he said, take as many men as you need, but bring Sandy Clark to this court today. And so Constable Calverly it didn't say if he took anyone with him, but he made the long trek out to the, the tenth line of Oro, probably a 10 or 15 mile walk, and uh, uh, approached Sandy Clark, and uh, he came without any resistance. So it probably tells me there was more than one constable doing the arresting, because Sandy Clark wasn't the guy to, to give in to authority. They dragged him down to the, to the courthouse. They had a trial right then and there. He was convicted of uh, uh, inciting a riot and he was sentenced to four months in jail. And he's the only one who paid a price um, for, the, for the Aurelia riot. What, what's interesting um, about this riot is what it foreshadowed for Aurelia, where again, this was a, this was a small town of 100 people in 1844, but uh, 30 years later, when the two railroads came to Aurelia and Aurelia had 2,000 people, um, it, it went through a decade of what, what we call the wild times. Again, there was still no police force. They, they, we created a police, police force in 1874. So before that, um, it was a booming lumber town. Um, and when the railways came, men flocked to Aurelia because of the booming economy. All these young men, um, um, 
with with no ties to anything coming to town and the bars were um, the busiest business in town and the no highland scots of oromadadi were still the instigators by then the black swamp gang had come into existence um, um led by big sandy mcduff now who was an outstanding athlete but he was a bully he was six foot four and 210 pounds and all you could handle in a brawl and they would come to town and take over a bar just itching for a fight. That was Aurelia for about 10 years before the uh, powers that be um, brought civilization to the town. So the, the Aurelia riot in 1844 was really presaging Aurelia of 1873. So there's my first story. Um, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll answer questions after we finish the whole talk. But you can go on the on the chat and type them in there, and Jane will collate them, and uh, we can get to those questions later. So let's move on a hundred years um, to 1942 in Aurelia, and this is the Brecken riot. Now, 1942 was World War II, um, and World War II was going very badly um, for the Allies. So the, in August of 1942. Um, Hitler in Germany had firm control of all of Europe, save England. And the English army and her empire armies, including the Canadian Expeditionary Force, were hunkered down on the island, awaiting the inevitable invasion that was coming. It was, morale was so low at that point. At the same time, Hitler had sent Rommel across North Africa, and he had advanced a thousand miles unopposed, and he was threatening Egypt and Cairo, and with the goal of capturing Suez Canal. And that looked like it was about to happen at any time. At the same time, Hitler had invaded Russia and had um, um, pushed the Russians back, Russians back. And he was in the midst of making a mad dash for the Caucasus and the Caucasus oil fields. And his armies were approaching Stalingrad, which was gonna be the dam on of all that. Um, but at this point, World War II was at its lowest ebb. And even in the Pacific, uh, Pearl Harbor had happened nine months earlier, and the Japanese had swarmed all across the South Pacific and they were threatening Australia. So all across the world, the Allied forces were at their lowest point in the whole of World War II. Um, and th th things were bad as, as that relates to Aurelia. Um, the, the Russians were begging the Allies to open a second front in France. And uh, the Allies were in no position to do that. Germany was so strong, and the English army was still building itself up. But they decided they had to do something. They had to do something to appeal um, to show Stalin they were doing something, something to boost morale in England. And as the modern research is showing, um, they were desperate to capture a, a German coding machine, an Enigma machine. So they staged a raid on Dieppe, and you've probably heard of Dieppe. Um, they sent 5,000 or so men across the channel. It's a raid in force on this small coastal town to test the defenses that the Germans had built there, looking to capture one of these machines that, that uh, encrypts all the German communications. It was a fiasco from start to finish. They got there and they didn't have the support they needed. The Germans were way stronger than they thought they were gonna be. Um, over 900 Canadians were killed. Um, 3,000 of the 5,000 men were killed, wounded or captured. Um, and the significant thing is there were a lot of Aurelia men in that Canadian force that was sent on that raid to Dia. So this was in August 19th, 1942. Aurelia had weekly newspapers. Every week after that, there would be more reports of which Aurelia soldiers had been lost or wounded or missing during that raid. Um, the, the paper um, for three weeks in a row um, showed a painful juxtaposition of these lists, as you see on the right, lists of the soldiers from Aurelia who were lost in the Dieppe raid. But on the same page, three columns over, you can see at the top, seven Aurelians found guilty connected to the Brecken riot. The Brecken riot was committed by uh, Aurelia soldiers who had just been recruited and were doing basic training at Camp Borden. 
while Aurelia men were sacrificing their lives on the raid in Dieppe, uh, three columns over, here's a bunch of new recruits cavorting and causing a ruckus out in Brecon. So in, in 1942, um, the war is at its, its worst point. The recruiting um, for the Canadian Army was at its peak. They, they were rounding up every available man to enlist, get trained, get over to Europe, um to to save the empire so a lot of Aurelia men were down at camp board and right then doing the training all the basic things you'd expect them to do um, they would spend a number of months at base board and doing their basic training and then they'd move over to other bases for specialized training and then they'd be sent to england for further training um, so these were the men who were right at the stage one of basic training learning to march learning to handle a gun all that kind of thing but they got they got time off. They got weekends off, and when when the men got time off, there wasn't much to do at Camp Borden. It was on the sand plain. There was no community around, so they headed home to Aurelia, because Aurelia um, went above and beyond what could be expected to to provide for the men to boost morale for the men. So the the two main venues are the YMCA, who opened their doors free of charge for all their facilities, so the gym and the pool, and they organized volleyball tournaments and basketball tournaments and wrestling and boxing uh, exhibitions. They had the pool room and the snooker room. Um, they had reading rooms. They, um, they um, married men could rent one of the dormitory rooms on the third floor with their wife. Um, or, uh, um, they provided showers for the men, which were, which were very popular. So the Y was a really popular place for the soldiers. But right next door, in behind the Y, you can see the steeple. That's the Anvian Church. And the other photo is the uh, Maple Leaf Club. So in the, um, uh, the Sunday school rooms, um, the ladies auxiliary at the, uh, at the Anglican Church formed the Maple Leaf Club. And the big appeal there was they staged dances on Tuesdays and Thursday nights where the soldiers could come in and dance with a woman. It might be a businessman's wife or a businessman's daughter and it was incredibly heavily chaperoned, but you could take a turn around the dance floor with a woman. Well, you can imagine the soldiers appreciated that. But uh, they also had a dry canteen, Aurelia being a dry town, so they would have you know lemonade and hamburgers and things like that. Um, and they provided sewing services and, and little things that the soldiers would need, they went out of their way to provide. So there was a lot to do in Aurelia. The favorite thing, if you read the papers back then, there was always advertisements in the classified ad um, for home hostess nights where uh, townspeople would invite whatever soldiers to come to their house for a specific event. So the ones I saw were um, five soldiers needed for a night of bridge or we're, we're hosting a musical night around the piano in our parlor and all soldiers are welcome. That kind of thing was going on. The, the, the citizens of Aurelia really, really went out of their way to entertain the soldiers and the soldiers um, flocked to Aurelia when they had time off. They just hop in the train and an hour later you're in town and, and away they go. But as you can imagine with, uh, with the army, a lot of that was wonderful and they appreciated it. But when they had leave time, there would be a section of the soldiers who wanted a little bit more than that. They wanted some beer. They wanted some hard liquor. They wanted women. They wanted to be able to bitch about their drill sergeants who make them get up at six in the morning and hike 10 miles with 50 pounds on their back. Um, they couldn't do that at the Y or at the Maple Leaf Club because they were heavily chaperoned. Um, they, they were the kind of people who didn't mind a little bit of a brawling. That was their entertainment. They couldn't find that in Aurelia because Aurelia was a dry town. Aurelia had outlawed alcohol in 1908 and they weren't going to bring, they weren't going to rescind that prohibition until 1961. So there was no alcohol to be had in Aurelia. Well, one of those soldiers who were stationed with the boys in Aurelia who came home with them was Ken Collins. And Ken Collins was from Brecon, 20 miles east of Aurelia. And uh, Ken was a bit of a brawler himself, and he attracted the brawlers to himself. So this little cabal of men who wanted more than a turn around the dance floor with a businessman's wife, um, they, they turned to Ken and Ken said, I know where we can get some booze. Come on out to Brecon 
to the Victoria Hotel. It's got the best bar going and uh, we'll find some things to do. So in mid-August, um, um, he took uh, some of these some of these fellow soldiers and a group of hanger on hangers on they found in Aurelia civilians and they would head out to Brecon. Um, I imagine the Aurelians came because they had the cars to transport them, but uh, they drive out there and uh, head to the bar and, and have have their good good time. Um, at the end of August, they had a bit of an incident. Um, they're in the bar and obviously causing problems because the bar owner, here's my dog, uh, the car owner cut them off at the bar and they weren't amused about that. And they started to rough up the young waiter, Jerry Kelly. So here's a young 21 year old who's got the job of telling these 10 soldiers, so sorry, no more for you. And uh, uh, punched him and he actually got a shiner um, out of, for his trouble. Well, there was uh, um, a farmer sitting at one of the tables who was witnessing this, um, a good family man, but who liked to like to get his, his beer and go down to the bar and catch up on the scuttlebutt and the gossip. Um, he saw poor Jerry Kelly, this young guy, get sucker punched by somebody and he came to his rescue. So this is John McFadden. Um, he gets up and challenges the soldiers and uh, they end up taking it outside and they had a bit of a fight and he laid a beating on one of the soldiers. Uh, the soldiers left, the whole group of them, saying, we'll be back, we'll be back, all upset. But uh, um, that was sort of the end of that incident. Well, on the night in question, um, was September 17th, no, sorry, sorry, September 4th, so the next week, um, Ken Collins rounds up about 10 or 12 of his soldier buddies. They pick up another 10 or 12 local Aurelians, and uh, after 10 o'clock at night, they head out to Brecon to the Victoria Hotel and its bar. Um, the, you have to remember in Brecon, it, Brecon was the center of a whole farming community. And um, on Friday and Saturday nights, there were often dances in the town put on by the Catholic Church in St. Andrew's Hall. And it was a sort of a tradition for the families, whole families to come into town and the mothers would do their shopping for the week. The, the fathers would uh, take equipment in for repair. And then they'd go off to the bar to have a beer and talk to their friends. And the kids would run around and do what kids would do. You know, horse wrestling and horse play and begging their parents for penny candy. Um, but it was the tradition. And that's what, that's what a Friday and Saturday night would be. And then um, after supper, um, everyone would uh, head on up to St. Andrew's Hall, the Catholic um, Hall, where there would be a dance. And uh, they'd stay until midnight with the dance and then the whole family would head home again. So on, on weekend nights, um, Brecon was a busy place and it was busy not with just men, but with whole families. There were a lot of kids running around. So on this night, September 4th, um, Ken Collins and all his men come out and uh, uh, they barge into the Victoria Hotel. And there's, um, you know, a, a few tables of farmers sitting around um, uh, having their beer. The, the uh, you know, we're at 10 30, 11 o'clock at night by now. So the dance is, is going and all the kids are up in the dance hall and the women are all up in the dance hall. And there's a the handful, of, handful of the older farmers in there just having their beer, keeping away from the noise. When in barges, 25 rowdy soldiers and their friends, all under the age of 22. Uh, crowd up, they push people out of the way up to the bar and they start demanding whiskey and demanding beer and making a general nuisance of themselves. Well, sitting at a table just off to the side was John McFadden, the man who had laid a beating on one of the soldiers the week before. Um, it, it, no one ever said exactly what happened, but you can imagine the insults started flying back and forth here and there. And, uh, the, one, the one quote is, uh, haven't you smart Alex got to go a war to go fight or something you know that kind of thing was going on because they were disrupting the 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 time the farmers were having in there well out of nowhere one of the privates one of the soldiers turns around and cold cocks John McFadden right in the face blindsided him knocked him down jumped on him and started beating on him and and four of his of his fellow soldiers joined into the fray so that John McFadden was taking a terrible beating and having trouble defending himself. One of the 
uh, bartenders was was there uh, decided to try and save them. Now the bartenders doubled as bouncers. Their sole purpose in these brawls when they happened was to protect the chattels of the bar, get the fighters out of there, get them in the lobby and push them out the street and let them fight all they want, but don't do it in here. We don't want you to break anything. So the three waiters job was to get this fight outside. So they see this local farmer getting beaten up. And so Tom Kelly, who is the brother of the of Jerry Kelly, who got the black eye the week before from these soldiers, Tom Kelly jumps in to try to, to um, help John McFadden and pull the pull soldiers off. And immediately he gets a black eye. Uh, and then for good measure, a minute later, he gets a black eye in the other eye. Um, but he does succeed in pulling the men off. Um, the other farmers in the room, like these are more of the middle and older age men. They're trying to decide what to do. Do we go in and help them? And we could really get hurt with, there's 25 of these guys, but they're making a mess of things. It, it took them some time to decide what to do. But then they started helping the bartenders try to push the soldiers towards the door. So in time, they were able to, to roll the fight out into the, into the foyer. And, and from there, it spilled out into the street. Um, so the, the bartenders did their job. But in, in the meantime, they had uh, broken four tables and, and three windows and, and three lamps, I think it said. So they had done some damage in the bar because this is a lot of guys more than usual duking it out in there. But poor John McFadden took a real beating. Um, he, was, he was left lying in the street. He had a serious shoulder injury. He couldn't raise his arm above his shoulder for the rest of his life after this fight. So the, the soldiers got their revenge. Um, but once, the, once that was over, they taken care of John. They're out in the street. They said, well, let's go to the dance. And so you can see they head across the street from Victoria Hotel up, up the stairs to St. Andrew's Hall. And uh, you go in the door and you walk this narrow stairway and then there was the big hall with the stage at one end where the band was playing. Well, within 30 seconds of them all barging up those stairs, a police car arrived. So right at the very start of the fight in the bar, the bar owner had phoned the police. There's no police in Brecon itself. Uh, the police station is in Beaverton, about 12 kilometers away. So the call went out to Beaverton. The police uh, radioed their men, and uh, the first car to arrive was Constable George Ewell. And he parked his car right where you can see in the, in the picture. Um, about 20 seconds later, the second car arrives with uh, R.A. Hewitt, who is a, um, a traffic constable, pulls up. Uh, they jump out of their car, and they decide that Hewitt will run into the Victoria Hotel and find out what the call was all about. But they knew the action was going to be at St. Andrews Hall. And so George Ewell decided that he was going to head straight up to where the dance was. So he followed the men up the stairs, probably like 30 seconds behind them. Um, so these 25 young men from Aurelia uh, go trudging up these stairs. They come to uh, um, young Basil Harrington, um, who's taking tickets for the $25 admission fee. They laugh him off and push him out of the way and just barge on past. And Basil was smart enough just to let them go. They head straight out onto the dance floor, 25 guys barging out onto the dance floor and immediately start a confrontation uh, with one of the young locals. And again, it was Frank Tunney, the guy who had blindsided John McFadden in the bar, blindsided some young farm boy on the dance floor and knocked him down. Well, Constable Yule had just come to the top of the stairs and turned to look in to see Tunney hit the farm boy. And so Yule goes racing out on the floor, grabs him by the scruff of the neck and drags him off towards the stairs. Now, George Yule is a pre pretty interesting guy. Like this isn't any ordinary policeman. It, it's an interesting story in that he was uh, um, 14 years old when World War I started. And just after his 15th birthday, he enlisted to go to World War I. And he was five foot seven by then and big enough. And he passed for 18 and they led him in the army. And he actually got all the way over to France and fought in some battles during World War I. He, he was still underage when the war ended. But uh, he had been a constable for 10 years. He was a tall, strapping, skinny, but strapping man, they called him. But uh, he was not one to shy away from, from uh, the roughhousing. So 
he's out there, he's grabbing this soldier by the scruff of the neck and manhandling him back to the stairs, intent on getting him down to the car. When he's at the top of the stairs, he could hear um, they hear someone yell out, they, they're taking Tunny Gang, and instantly four soldiers are racing after Yule. Yule starts pulling Tunny down the stairs, and when he gets halfway down, he's on the stair landing, these other four soldiers start punching and kicking him. Um, so Yule stops, he pushes his, his prisoner, Tunny, up against the wall, and Tunny just stands there and watches. He turns around and starts swinging his billy club. The first guy who got in his way took it right in the face, smashed all his teeth out. And that really slowed the soldiers down. They all backed off when they saw the blood splattered on the wall. Um, the Tunny is still standing with his back against the wall. Yule grabs him by the scruff of the neck, throws him down the stairs. By this point, the second officer, Hewitt, was at the bottom of the stairs and he grabs Tunny and starts dragging him outside. So the two, two constables are outside, they have their man. They're walking from St. Andrew's Hall down to put him into the patrol car. Well, by then, the soldiers have got their bearings again. And they, all 25 of them, follow them down the stairs. And when they get out in the street, this is a gravel road, they start pelting the officers with rocks. It says, you're not taking them. You're not taking one of our, our soldiers. Let Tunny go. And they start pelting them with rocks. So the soldiers are cowering and putting their hands over their heads. And they turn and swing their billy clubs. And that just eggs the, eggs the soldiers on and more rocks come their way. So let's just get out of here. So they run to the car and the soldiers run after them. Um, when they get there, he opens the back door. He throws Tunny into the back seat, slams the door, turns around and is confronted by a 16 year old girl, um, Mary Thompson had just turned 16 and she had come out with all the Aurelia soldiers. She jumps up, she grabs Constable Yule around the neck, digs her fingernails into the back of his neck enough that he's bleeding. And later on um, at, the, at the trial, it says that he's permanently scarred by her fingernails. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll stay back at this, the first slide. Um, he throws her to the ground and he jumps in the car. The crowd of soldiers encircle the car and start rocking it back and forth. Constable Hewitt has his back against the passenger door. He's being pressed up there by all the soldiers and they start rocking the car back and forth, back and forth. They get the car way up on two wheels and as it falls to the ground, Yule hits the gas, spins the tires, sprays gravel behind the car, and it speeds forward. He almost ran some of the soldiers over. They had the jet, but he races off down the road towards Aurelia, down, down the road as you're looking in that picture. Um, and suddenly Constable Hewitt is standing there among the 25 uh, boisterous Aurelia soldiers who are all high on adrenaline now for intimidating the police. They're heaving rocks down the road after the police car. Um, at the trial, they said uh, the, the back of the car was all dented by rocks and three of the windows of the police car were broken by these rocks they were, they were throwing at the car as it left. Hewitt, to his credit, saw his opportunity and, and backed away, wielding his billy club into the shadows. Um, a couple of the soldiers were threatening him and throwing rocks at him, but they let him go. And that leaves these 25 soldiers standing in the middle of the intersection of Brecon at midnight, patting each other on the back, heady at their intimidation of the cops, yelling and swearing down the street at them, totally unaware that while all this was going on, the young men of Brecon had been coming down the stairway out of Seattle's Hall and had been gathering on the sidewalk um, beside the building. About 50 men and farm boys were lining up confronting the 25 soldiers who were causing such a ruckus. Well, the Constable Ewell stopped his patrol car about 300 yards down the road. He jumped into the back seat. He handcuffed um, uh, Frank Tunney to the car, told him not to move. And then the two policemen um, knew what was about to happen because they could look back down the road and they saw 25 soldiers confronting 
50 farmers and they knew what was gonna, gonna happen. So they're pulling up their billy clubs and it's up to them to bring some civility to this. And they're just starting the roads to try to break up the brawl that had already started when they heard sirens coming up behind them and two more police cars from Aurelia arrived. So the, uh, the police station in Brecon had called the police station in Aurelia at the same time they called Ewell to come in. They, they called for a car from Aurelia to come up. So it took them an extra 10 minutes to get there, but uh, two more policemen in an Aurelia police car and significantly two military police from Camp 26 in Aurelia arrived. So now there were six officers going in to break this brawl up of about 75 men who by now were having a free-for-all in the middle of the intersection of Brecon at midnight. So Constable Ewell filled the other men in of, of who the troublemakers were and who they were after. And in they went and they started arresting men one by one and, and handcuffing them. They weren't there to arrest people for brawling. Their goal was to arrest people for two things. One was obstructing a police officer in, in his duty and two, causing willful damage to the police car and to the bar. And uh, one by one, they'd, they'd peel the soldier that you will identify, they'd peel him off and throw him in handcuffs and drag him down to one of the cars. And uh, this went on for an hour because they would, they would subdue the fight and then another one would start and they'd subdue that and then another one started. This went on and on and on. But they ended up arresting 17 men. Every single one of them was from Aurelia. They didn't, they didn't approach a single man from Brecon who was equally guilty of brawling because they only wanted the men who were obstructing the police in the, in the operation of their duty. So they arrested 17 men. It took an hour. So by about 1 a.m., things had finally calmed down. The Brecon men were smart enough to drift away and get in their cars and go home. And no point in getting arrested um, because they weren't, it wasn't, they were just defending their town. Um, but it was the Aurelia boys who were out there to cause trouble who were going to pay for causing that trouble. So uh, they were hauled down to the police station in, in uh, Beaverton which was in the courthouse. It was in City Hall. And so the, you can go to the next slide. So this is the City Hall at that time. The basement was the police station and the jails. Um, the main floor was the courthouse and the upstairs was the City Hall. And so they're dragged down and they're thrown into jail. Now, normally this was a Friday night. Normally um, they would be um, up, up for, before a police magistrate on Monday morning, but for some reason, they were held in that jail for nine days. Um, so a whole week went by. Um, so not, they didn't go on Monday, they went the following Monday. So these guys spent nine days in jail. These are soldiers and basic training with a weekend leave and they're in jail for nine days. You can imagine how that's gonna go over with their superior officers. The, the uh, police officials, phoned base Borden, informed them that we've got some of your men in our jail. And uh, uh, they sent uh, some officers down to represent these, these men in the trial. But on that, on that um, Monday, the 17th, I forget who it was, um, um, they had the trial. Uh, they had all, th all three of the waiters gave evidence. John McFadden gave evidence, the man who got beaten up. Um, three of the police officers gave extensive evidence. George Ewell was very frank in what he had to say. Um, and then the, uh, the Aurelia boys were given a chance to defend themselves. That trial took all day. And on Tuesday morning, um, the judge gave his verdict. And we can go to the next slide. Um, two, Two people were given suspended sentences. And it's interesting, the first one was Frank Tunney. Now Tunney is the guy who blindsided and cold cocked George McFadden and started the riot up in the dance hall. Um, he, the person who vouched for him was none other, none other than Constable George, uh, George Ewell. Um, he said that Tunney had been the model prisoner. He didn't resist when he dragged him off the floor. He didn't get into the fight on the stair landing. Um, he got into the car without fighting back. He stayed in the car for an hour and a half while the whole brawl was going on. He had been a model prisoner and George Ewell spoke highly of him. And for that reason, the judge um, gave him a pretty lenient sentence. He was given a one year probation 
Um, he was released on his own recognizance. He had to report to a judge um, once a month for a year. Well, he was off to the war in Europe. So that was basically, he just let him go. But the other person was young Mary Thompson, the 16 year old girl who had attacked, attacked the constable. And you can imagine with this brawling going on, all these big guys fighting it out, they went to the trouble to arrest a 16 year old girl. And it shows you just how mad Yule was at her attack on him. And she surely was interfering with the, the, the policeman um, carrying out his duty. Um, again, her mother pleaded for her, for mercy for her. She said, I am recently widowed. I can't control my daughter, but we're moving to Toronto and she's going to be under the guidance of her brother-in-law um, next month. And so the judge says because she's never been in trouble with the law, because she is such a tender age, because she's going to have uh, male supervision, we hope that she can straighten her life out. One year probation, she has to report to a judge once a month for a year in Toronto. So those two got off pretty easily. But five more men were convicted of obstructing justice. Um, um, four of them were soldiers and one was a civilian. Six more were also convicted. Um, the first five were, were not given bail. They were to be held in jail for two weeks until their sentencing. The other six were convicted, but they were allowed to go home on their own recognizance as long as they returned for the sentencing trial in two weeks. Again, two soldiers and three civilians. Two of them had charges dropped because they just couldn't identify them well enough. And two were actually acquitted. And it's interesting, it was Constable Ewell said that these were the two who were trying to stop the others. They were trying to quell their passions, this is how we put it. And so they, they got acquitted. So they, some of the soldiers went back, um, back to Camp Borden a week late, a week AWOL, and probably got some trouble there. But two weeks later, they all reappeared and uh, they had their superior officers in tow to represent them at the sentencing trial on September, on September 20th, 28th. So what happened there is um, five men were given jail sentences. Now, again, these are soldiers on basic training. You know, there's a desperate war going on in Europe. And here they are in jail for brawling. But you can see from 30 days to three months. Um, four more were fined $15, which was a significant amount of money back then. Um, and it's interesting that uh, one of them, uh, Garnet Matheson, age 17, he refused to pay. So they threw him in jail for 15 days. It, it Maybe he just didn't have $15. Who knows? When I, when I was writing this, I wrote the whole thing. And uh, civilian Terry Gordon, um, he's listed as Robert Gordon. And it wasn't after I published the book. And my cousin told me, you know, Robert Gordon, you know, that's your uncle. <laughs> Turns out my uncle Terry was one of the guys in, in this fight. That made me, made me snicker when I heard that. So um, two, um, two other people had their, their charges dismissed and they didn't say why. Um, so that was what, that's what the civil, civil authorities did to them. But if we go to the next slide, you can imagine what happened when these soldiers got back to base board. Desperate times for the Canadian Army. They're in basic training. Now they've, they're going to be gone for almost four months, some of them. They're basically missing a whole round of basic training. They're going to have to be assigned to new units. You can imagine how many potatoes those guys were peeling and probably months and months of peeling potatoes. Um, they were not, the brass didn't look kindly on this kind of thing. Um, these soldiers, though, did ultimately get a chance to redeem themselves. Um, this was September of, of uh, 1942. In June of 1944 came Operation Overlord, which was D-Day, is when the British and, and now the Americans finally launched a massive attack on Europe to, uh, to overrun Germany. Um, these soldiers undoubtedly were part of that invasion. The men, while they were brawling in Brecon, Aurelia soldiers were dying on the beaches of Dieppe. Well, now they were able to finish the job those, those Dieppe soldiers were doing. They were part of the invasion that put an end to the war. So they did get a chance to redeem themselves, but you never, you never outlive uh, um, um, the, the, the kind of black mark on, on their record that they had the day in Brecon. And as this final comment, it's, it's rather interesting that after the war, Ken Collins, 
the uh, the rowdy guy who brought everyone out to Brecon every week, he ended up being a bartender at the Victoria Hotel. So I guess everything goes around in circles. So that's the end of my talks. Um, if you have any questions, I'm really happy to answer questions. You can just uh, type them into the chat line and uh, Jane will, will uh, get us organized for that. So are you there, Jane? That's right, it took me a minute to turn on my right. video there. Yes, I am. Thank yeah. you so much, Dave. I love the stories. We were talking about this the other day. History comes alive through the stories. So thank you so much for explaining, you know, it's, it's great to read a book and your books are fantastic, but listening to you tell the stories makes it come <laughs> to life. So thank you so much. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments for Dave? Hi. Hi, hi, Dave. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, just, I just want to thank you so much. Uh, we've recently moved to Lagoon City, which of course is in Brecon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that corner we know so very well. And I just really appreciate hearing the stories that Brecon was once, you know, obviously a bit of a thriving little town and that it had a hotel and everything. And <laughs> it's right where the donut shop is now. Yes, it is. Yeah. And you've got your picture on the on that same slide uh, on the right hand side that um, it says picture looking up or down the road towards Aurelia. Yeah. And George is on the left. It's actually on the right. Oh, is it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you look at your picture, you can see it's on the right, not the left. But your words say it's on the left. Yeah. Yeah. But very, very well done and mm. informative. Much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, 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 I talked to three guys from Brecon, one who was actually there. Um, he was the son of Tom Kelly, I think it was. Um, but uh, um, they are all gave me the impression they're sort of proud of their history of being a hot town on a Saturday night. It's, it's sort of it's the it's the persona of Brecon and, and, and they're kind of proud of that. And I thought that was that was interesting. Okay, we have a Dave. question. Does the Victoria Hotel still stand at the corner where the traffic light in Brecon is located? Yeah, Victoria Hotel was torn down in 1989 and now it's a donut shop. So it's still where the farmers come to get the scuttlebutt and gossip and talk oh, politics, sorry. but now they have a donut instead of a beer. So, sorry, sorry to interrupt. The mm. donut shop's been gone for years. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's the Brecon Pharmacy and walk-in clinic. Okay, good yeah. for you. Okay, great. I haven't been there in a while. Second yeah. <laughs> question is, is there any evidence that rowdy Sandy Clark was related to Aurelia's mare? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> They're both big guys, though, so... <laughs> Dave, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, Norm Key here. Um, you mentioned in 1844 that there were 500 men brawling but yes. you don't mention whether anyone uh, was killed or whether yeah. there were any serious injuries. Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember my early days in Arroyo working in the Emerge when I would see uh, the results of, um, of mm -hmm. fights brought in and some horrific injuries. Yeah, um, and I know exactly what you're saying. I had the exact same question. Nothing about this riot was ever written down until about 1892 when uh, Constable Calverly, so the, the man who was sent to arrest um, um, Big Sandy, um, um, he was interviewed by the editor of the Aurelia newsletter and said, you know, have you ever heard of the, the, uh, the Aurelia riot? And he related the story to him and then they printed it in the paper. And that's the real basis for this whole story. So I, I discovered it that way and, and then started searching for, for more information. But nowhere does it, did they ever report on serious injuries. There, there had to be, they say they were, they were throwing heavy stones into the crowd and they were beating on people with, with those pickets. So the, you had a club in your hand, you could do some damage. There's probably nails on some of them. So I'm, I'm willing to bet there were significant injuries. But again, we're dealing with pioneer times where when men 
shook injuries off. You didn't have a choice. You got injured and you just had to carry on. You know, if you don't work, then your family doesn't eat. You know, you, you, your, your sustenance, your, your crops depended on you doing it and you sucked it up and you got it done. I imagine there were a lot of people with significant injuries who just carried on with life and hoped it got better. I mean, the, the, uh, the medical profession in 1844 wasn't going to do a whole lot for you other than maybe put a splint on a broken bone and, and, and wrap a, you know, wrap a wound up, you know, maybe, maybe they could suture them, but there was pretty minimal um, medical care at that time anyway. So I bet there was just a lot of concussions and a lot of contusions and, and bruises and who knows what, but yeah, I, I had the exact same question and I couldn't find anything just because there's so little written about it. Thank you. Great talk. Great. Yeah, evening. Good. Good. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions or comments? Oh, here's uh, excellent, Dave. Thank you. Wonder if my grandfather came out from Aurelia as a police member. He was hired because of his fighting ability. He often mentioned during the war fighting in an establishment in Aurelia. Mm -hmm. Aurelia, well, it's interesting that um, I, I've done a lot of research, but pre World War I. And they all say that the constables were recruited as um, from the biggest men in Aurelia. Basically, you weren't supposed to pull a gun or anything. You were supposed to be able to manhandle people. So the biggest, toughest guys were recruited to be the police officers. So, you know, Sim and Sam Cotton in the 1890s were, were six foot one and 210 pounds. You know, they could wade into any melee and hold their own. They, they were always big, tough guys. And there were up until around 1900 there were just regular brawls in Aurelia in the 18 in the 18 late 1870s early 1880s it was if not a nightly event it was multiple multiple times a week there would be a brawl outside a bar at some point in 1874 you know it really was a town of some 2,000 people and there were 28 bars I mean there was it was a wash in alcohol and all these young men with nothing better to do they were brawling just went on and on and on there was the Black Swamp Gang who came out of Oro. There was another gang of the Reagans who came out of Romera. And both of them would come in, they'd take over a bar and just looking for a fight. And often they'd find each other and then watch out because these are tough guys who knew what to do. Them. Um, but uh, the policemen had to be able to go in and hold their own in those fights. So the uh, the constables were all big guys, that's for sure. And there was, and the brawling went on. Um, um, pretty much until Prohibition in 1908. Um, but the late 1890s, they, they, the town became more civil. But uh, that was one of the things after the Prohibition came in. It, this is another thing I wrote, but uh, about six years later, a temperance worker came to Aurelia to, to assess how successful is the banning of alcohol to a community. And one of the things he wrote about is that there's no brawling. In five years after Prohibition, there's no brawling in Aurelia. So he had a vested interest in saying that, but that's what they comment on, that the alcohol was causing it. And it really was a wash in alcohol in the 1870s, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. That's probably why Prohibition actually came in. Yeah. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> that's another whole talk I could do, Prohibition, really. That's a, yeah. that's a really interesting topic. <laughs> uh, Dave, uh, yeah, uh, Dave, it's Paul Raymond yeah. here. Uh, <clears throat> I find that I find it very very interesting. I love the uh, aerial shot. I don't know quite know how they got that one, but uh, I don't either. <laughs> uh, the uh, the it was interesting because the right behind the Victoria Hotel was a thing called the Manse. It was the United Church Manse, which I always thought was interesting. They had a United Church Manse, you know, uh, mm -hmm. fifty feet from the Victoria Hotel, and we had that as a store in the seventies and early eighties. And uh, I can assure you, the Victoria was just as rowdy. Uh, and, parking lot fights in the 70s and 80s as well and yeah. uh i think in part it was the wonderful irish out there that, that uh, <laughs> even though it's a scottish name it was full of irishmen but i thought it was very very interesting and i thought the um list of your uh of the culprits if you will from Aurelia, there's some very recognizable names there <laughs> as one of your people anyone's related to those names like i'm related to one of them <laughs> well, it's it's also so they went on to be great coaches and wonderful people. Good and family I guess, men, yeah. I guess they're eighteen. But they're they're all twenty old. years old, you know. Yeah, well, Rhea maybe was even a little more boring in those days than it is now. But I appreciate that David. It's wonderful chat, and and uh, I hope there's some people from Brecon are, are listening to this as well tonight. So thank you. It's great. Right.
I have to say of all of all the books I've published, um, the Brecken Riot is by far my bestseller because it because I wrote it like seven years ago. Um, but the uh, Romera Historical Society, I give them to them at cost, and then they've been selling them as a fundraiser, and they've sold a whole whack of copies, and uh, hopefully they raise a little money doing that. But uh, it's my best-selling book. Anyone who has anything to do with Brecken snatches it up, you know, for five bucks, why not? Everyone, everyone in Brecken wants to know about it. <laughs> Okay, we have another uh, comment. Thank you so much, Dave. We really enjoyed the talk, Paul and Mary Connor. Excellent. Yeah, I hope you guys come back to future talks from the library. I'm really glad to see Jane is organizing this. You, you guys know Jane is the, the community outreach person at the library. She does all kinds of amazing things, but this is the kind of stuff that she provides for the community. The, the library is so much more than just a place to go to get a book, and, and Jane's a big part of that. Well, thank you and stay tuned, everybody, because we're going to have Dave back. So <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um, and if if we can do it in person, you know, when things come down, but in the meantime, it's, we'll we'll get together on Zoom. So it's it's a lot it's easier in person, let me tell you. I'm sitting here <laughs> talking to a computer. It's not it's not straightforward. I, yeah. I apologize for all the, the station breaks and ums. <laughs> no worries it was fantastic we've got a lot of people thanking you rusty Good. thomas um yeah everybody's completely oh someone's waving at me does that mean you have a yeah. question or yes uh dan and mary oliver here and, and dave thank you again for uh, your talk tonight um this is the second time we've heard that we were at the uh, romera historical society meeting when you gave your first talk out here mm -hmm. we do have book and it is great and it was ironic that when we had first moved here to Romero 99 shortly after that I had been talking with uh, the mayor at the time and he told me about the story of the Brecken riot and then when you reiterated it and have come up with all these details just amazing absolutely mm -hmm. amazing and it, it takes it take it takes on a whole different context when you when you see what was going on with the war around it. It makes it all the more poignant. I'm always looking for things like that that makes the story interesting. And you did, having spent a fair amount of time training in Camp Borden and knowing what some of those soldiers would be like. Yes, you did a terrific job describing it tonight. I thank mm -hmm. you very, very much. Good, thank you. <laughs> and uh, Kelty says, loved it, well done, fun way to learn about Aurelia. <laughs> And absolutely, that is the truth. So, um, anyone I else? Then? Oh, I just, I just have uh, just a little aside. Mm -hmm. I saw the link to this in the Aurelia News because I'm a subscriber and I get it online. But our local library would be the Ramara Library. Is there any th thought given to um, uh, linking the Ramara Library in so that people that belong to the Ramara Library would hear about this, even if they don't get the newspaper, and then be able to, because this was fabulous. Um, it really was. We could let them know about the YouTube link. Right. Um, but it was put out through the Ramara Public Library and uh, oh, okay. Margaret's uh, coming events. Uh, that's we saw it in two places out here. Oh, okay. There you go. Thank you. I didn't know. So we can definitely um, let, let the library know that we have the link um, that they can get on our YouTube channel. Super. And, uh, this, it, so I I'm actually going to if if so it'll be published. The link will be published. Um, uh, probably later tomorrow. Um, Daniel has to do a little bit of housekeeping to the actual video and then okay. uh, we'll post the link probably on our Facebook page and make it available. Okay, so how would I, I'm, you know, a little bit of technique, technique challenge. How, so I would go on Facebook and what would I look up? Uh, Aurelia Public Library. Aurelia our, Public Library. Oh, our, that's easy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> or okay. you can always... You can always call or email the library and they'll talk you how to get to the link. Okay, super. Okay. I, I have I have about 500 email addresses for people in Lagoon City and I give them little, you know, hints and tips and 
I would like to shoot this out for them. Hey, point of interest. Yeah, no, so, for sure. That'd be okay. awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, and, thank you. This was wonderful. <laughs> and uh, last comment. Thank you. Enjoyed your talk. Well done. So I'm going mm -hmm. to agree with that. Dave, thank mm -hmm. you so much for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. We'll, we'll definitely have you back um, <laughs> sooner than later, I hope. And uh, everybody be safe, be well, and thank you for joining us tonight. Great. Thanks, Jane. Okay, take thank care. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>